Okay, okay, everyone, it's time to begin. Welcome to the fall 22 season of the virtual museum lecture series presented by the St. Catharines Museum and Welland Canal Center. I'd like to begin with a Indigenous land acknowledgement. Our community is filled with diverse stories, and we recognize that our story begins with the Indigenous peoples of this land. We acknowledge that we are broadcasting this lecture on lands that have been inhabited by Indigenous peoples for millennia, and we would like to honor the centuries of Indigenous peoples who've walked on Turtle Island before us. My name is Sarah Nixon, public programmer at the St. Catharines Museum and Welland Canal Center, and I am so thrilled to be here tonight. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to everyone joining us from your screens this evening, whether you're tuning in live or after the fact. And a very special welcome to any audience members out there who are new to the series. Thank you for joining us. We hope that these lectures provide a bit of historical joy and spark imagination and exploration of our city's rich history. And there are so many ways to join in on the historical fun and get your local history fix. And my slides already aren't working. There we go. <laughs> um, Yes, yeah, so you can actually view all, all of our past lectures on our YouTube channel playlist, and you can listen to lecture audio on our podcast, VMLS Avaya Podcast, where you can find, you can find this podcast uh, series anywhere that you listen to your own podcasts under STC Museum Podcast. That's kind of the brand. Um, and as always, please feel free to make use of the chat box to answer any questions or send comments. We will be moderating these during and at the end of the presentation. Now, there is a slight delay in the broadcast, so if we miss your question, we'll get to it at the end of the presentation. And we so appreciate you joining the lecture series, and we would equally appreciate a donation in support of our programming. Your donations help us continue to provide the high quality and enjoyable programming that you've come to expect from us. And we really appreciate any donation you're able to make. You can give us a call at 905-984-8880 or uh, visit our donation portal on the active STC website to make a donation. Your donations really do make a difference. Thank you. Okay, before I hand it over to our very knowledgeable guest speaker this evening, I would like to share some of our upcoming lectures of the season, something to look forward to. On November 1st, we welcome very special guest and historian Dr. Jonathan Vance to discuss his research into corporate memorials with a lecture titled, Our Gallant Employees, Corporate Commemoration in Post-War Canada. And then on November 15th, our curator Kathleen Powell will deliver a lecture about the interwar period in St. Catharines titled In the Public Interest, Public Works in St. Catharines Between the World Wars. On November 29th, our special guest, local historian and chair of the city's heritage committee, Brian Nari, will return to the series to give a talk about early settlement in St. Catharines with a title I'm nervous to say aloud. <laughs> I'm titling this lecture, The Ponderous Frouse Miners and Jaded Farm Horses or early St. Catharines before the first Welland Canal. Definitely looking forward to this one. And lastly, our final virtual museum lecture of the year, we are happy to welcome back Dr. Kimberly Monk on December 13th to provide a update on her work at the Shakuna Shipyard Dig. After two long years away from the site, Dr. Mike, Dr. Monk has been back uh, this past summer, and we're looking forward to welcoming her back to hear more about this fascinating history. Okay, that's it. 
And now I am so, so happy to welcome tonight's special guest lecturer, the Reverend Dr. Paul Miller to our lecture tonight. I will stop sharing my screen and I'll welcome Paul to join us. Thanks, Sarah. Great to be here. Wonderful. Okay, take it away. I'll give you the virtual mic. <laughs> okay. Thanks so much. Well, it is uh, it is wonderful to be here. Um, I'm going to start my screen share. And you'll be seeing my slides mostly for the rest of the presentation. So beginning in September 2020, I became the uh, part-time minister of Westminster United Church in St. Catharines, which is located at 180 Queenston Street. And this was in the middle of COVID restrictions when the, we couldn't hold any events or activities outside recorded Sunday services. Uh, I wasn't able to visit anybody in the hospital or in their homes. So I thought, what can I do? And I invited people to share stories about Westminster uh, which I found endlessly fascinating, and it sparked my interest in the wider neighborhood, the Queenston neighborhood where the church is located. Uh, Queenston's a part of St. Catharines that has fallen uh, on hard times uh, in recent years. Um, today, it's one of the, I think, probably the most disadvantaged economically and socially neighborhoods in Niagara. And in the minds of many, it's kind of our poster child for urban decay conjuring up uh, pictures like these, images like these of boarded up storefronts, empty lots, homeless encampments, and that great sprawling pile of rubble once known as the St. Catharines General Hospital. Uh, but as I spoke with people who grew up in Queenston and with those who live and work there today, I came to see it with different eyes. And my hope is that recovering a sense of pride in Queenston's past can generate a commitment to the present and hope for the future. So officially, the Queenston neighborhood uh, extends as far east as Bunting Road and as far north as the QEW. But the neighborhood I'm gonna talk about tonight is somewhat more compact than that, bounded by Geneva Street to the west, East Chester to the east, Welland Ave to the north, and Oakdale to the south. So if you're familiar with the city, you'll, um, you'll have an idea of where I'm talking about. And I'm calling this presentation Queenston a working neighborhood. And I, I want to use that word working in two senses. First, Queenston's a neighborhood where people have and continue to work. And two, Queenston has been a neighborhood that works for the people who call it home. And I believe it can work again. Uh, in the mid-19th century, Queenston was the far eastern edge of St. Catharines. And some of its earliest residents were escaped slaves who found their way to Canada via the Underground Railroad. Harriet Tubman and other key figures in the abolitionist movement lived and worked here. And a significant black community grew up along North Street in proximity to the Salem Chapel, the British Methodist Episcopal Church that still stands on Geneva Street, which provided welcome and support to those escaping slavery. But as John Jackson and Sheila Wilson note in their comprehensive history of the city, St. Catharines, Canada's Canal City, the black community, while they found freedom in Canada, were never fully accepted. And so they made their home on the margins in Queenston. And it's these early beginnings, I believe, that shaped the, new, the unique character of the neighborhood. My thesis is that Queenston has always been a working class community a place where people of somewhat lower status and lower income could find a place and build a life. One of the reasons that Queenston worked for its residents uh, in the past was that there was employment. Before the automobile, people had to work close to home. And if you walk around the neighborhood, you'll see interspersed with houses, a surprising number of buildings that survive to this day that at one time were clearly places of employment. Queenston attracted small to mid-sized businesses as opposed to uh, the larger factories that were built along the second Welland Canal and taking advantage of the canal raceway that ran along the southern edge of Queenston along Oakdale and Gale Crescent and then down to the city center. 
providing water and power to larger enterprises like Canada Hair Cloth or Norris Roller Mills. The 1913 fire insurance maps, which are part of the museum's great collection, uh, shows a wide variety of smaller businesses, machine shops, a, car a carriage manufacturer, a planing mill, grocers, a lumber yard, carpentry shops, a meat packer, dry goods store, and a greenhouse. There were some larger industries as well, such as this building at the corner of Page and Davidson Streets. Originally the site of the first CCM bicycle factory in Canada, from 1916 it was home to Monarch Knitting, a manufacturer of men's and women's hosiery with plants in Dunville and Ajax, as well as St. Catharines. At its height, the St. Catharines factory employed almost 200 men and women, and here's a newspaper photograph of the workforce in the 1930s. In 1968, Monarch Knitting became Montex Apparel. Uh, it was still providing decent unionized jobs, but the handwriting was on the wall, unable to compete in a world of cheap imported textiles and fabrics, Montex closed. The building was taken over by Stokes Seeds, and it is now the Stokes Community Village, owned and operated by Goodwill Industries. This large campus incorporates affordable housing units for seniors, a community center, plus office and meeting space for a variety of not-for-profit organizations. Another major employer in the Queenston neighborhood was, was Grouts Limited, located at 340 Welland Ave. Grout's parent company was based in Norwich, England, with subsidiaries around the world, including St. Catharines and Valleyfield, Quebec, and they were noted producers of quality silk fabric. In the 1880s, Grout specialized in black crepe, which was very important in the 19th century. It was used in making uh, mourning garments, especially for women. Victorian custom dictated that women in particular, who were mourning the, the death of a close relative, were to dress only in black for a period of between six months for a grandparent or sibling to two full years for a husband. And uh, Grouts provided the fabric that went into those mourning uh, garments. Uh, Grouts, started, Grouts Canada started operations in 1923. Uh, silk manufacturing required a skilled workforce and Grouts provided well-paying jobs, many of which were filled by, by women. Grouts was an adaptable company constantly responding to changes in the business environment. Uh, when the supply of silk from Japan, China, and Italy was cut off during World War II, Grouts pivoted to synthetic fabrics. And during the war, they were a major supplier of parachutes to the Canadian and British Armed Forces. After the war, they returned to making fine quality fabrics for women's lingerie and coat linings. Grouts recognized the importance of investing in a skilled workforce. An article in the St. Catherine Standard from March 1946 describes Grouts this way, as a progressive, forward-thinking concern engaged in an industry in which both domestic and foreign competition is keen, who realize that its success depends upon a well-trained and loyal staff of employees under a leadership capable of creating fabrics acceptable to the trade at costs to compare favorably with those obtainable elsewhere. To that end, Grouts established its own textile trade school to ensure that it had the skilled workers it needed. The company also maintained an extensive trade library so that employees could continue to keep up with industry changes. But innovation alone could not sustain the competitiveness of this industry. Grout ceased operations in St. Catharines in 1955. The building was purchased by Anthus Imperial, which was at that time the largest Canadian manufacturer of heating and plumbing products, including pipes, boilers, furnaces, and fuel tanks. Uh, and today it is the home of the Book Depot. So Queenston was a working class community. That was its character, its DNA. Not everybody worked in the neighborhood, but it was the salaries earned in manufacturing and other industries that supported households. Now, there's a man in my church who grew up in Queenston during the 1970s, and he recalls his teacher at Connaught Public School asking each child where his or her father worked, and with one or two exceptions, everybody said General Motors. 
So it was common for people to start out in Queenston, get established, prosper, and then move to newer or more upscale parts of the city to be replaced by a new generation of working families, many of them new Canadians. Manufacturing jobs were the lifeblood of Queenston, but also its vulnerability. And I think Queenston's a great example of the local impact of global trends. With globalization of trade and offshoring of manufacturing to cheaper labor markets, the industrial sector of St. Catharines began a decline in the 1970s, a trend that accelerated through the 2000s. St. Catharines went into an economic decline, but no part of the city felt the impact more, clean, more keenly rather than Queenston. Another major event occurred in 2013 with the closure of the St. Catharines General Hospital. As someone who spent a lot of my time professionally in the old general, it was pretty obvious that this building was far past its best by date, but its closure further devastated the neighborhood. Hospitals create ecosystems of small businesses, restaurants, corner stores, pharmacies, beauty parlors, florists, gift shops, offices that provide both employment but also social value to the community. And the fact that the hospital site has remained vacant years after its demolition just contributes to the depressing appearance of Queenston Street. So I, Queenston has a rich employment history and I think it's well worth exploring in greater depth. A second key asset in the Queenston neighborhood were the social institutions that supported and enriched the lives of its residents. Sociologist Robert Putnam has described the explosion of what he calls associational groups in the US beginning in the late 19th century and extending through the post-World War II era, service clubs, sports leagues, political associations, fraternal lodges, craft groups, card playing circles, religious gatherings. The 20th century, Putnam says, was the golden age of belonging. His context is American, but I think his description applies equally well to Canada. These groups created a sense of identity and belonging. They were the glue that held neighborhoods together, and they built what sociologists call social capital, that web of relationships and connections that make for healthy, resilient, and growing communities. Among the core institutions in the Queenston neighborhood were its faith communities. Uh, it's easy to forget today when many religious congregations are in decline, the central role that they used to play in community life. A church was not just a place to go to worship on Sunday morning. Churches provided community space, a social safety net, business and professional connections, and a range of activities from cradle to grave that benefited not only their congregants, but the neighborhood as a whole. 60 years ago, seven out of 10 Canadians attended church every week. Church was a huge part of people's lives. In the days before schools had gymnasiums, space for youth sports was provided by churches. So for example, my own congregation, Westminster, built a large gym in 1952 that was home to scouting groups, basketball leagues, and many other activities for the whole community. The faith communities in Queenston historically both shaped and were shaped by the distinctive character of the neighborhood. Let's just say that by and large, they were not the churches that the doctors and the lawyers and the business executives attended. They were churches of working people for working people. Their congregations were made up of people who were, you know, a little more on the margins of St. Catherine's society. So for example, St. Barnabas Anglican Church on Calvin Street is a great example. It was founded in the, 19, sorry, the 1870s for the express purpose of providing a spiritual home for people who could not afford pew rents at the more prestigious St. George's on Church Street. Renting your own pew for you and your family was both a, great, a sign of status and a major source of church income in the 19th century. The higher the rent, the better the seat. So you could see at a glance the social stratification of the community display, displayed on Sunday morning. People without financial resources were either left out or consigned to a crowded balcony. Haynes Avenue Presbyterian Church, which dates from 1876, 
lists among its founding members carpenters, laborers, market gardeners, and servants. Its first building was replaced in 1895 by a red brick structure, which still stands at the corner of Queenston Street and Oakdale Ave, and is now home to Westview Christian Fellowship. In 1925, Haynes Avenue Presbyterian Church became Westminster United Church. In 1926, the congregation had grown to the point where they built the much bigger present structure at 180 Queenston. But to this day, the congregation retains its, a very down to earth and unpretentious character. So Queenston was a place where people got a start, bought their first home, raised their kids, and in many cases moved on when they were more established. A similar pattern is true of some faith communities that originated in Queenston. So Elam Fellowship, an early Pentecostal congregation from a time when Pentecostalism was not regarded as the most respectable form of Christianity, purchased that second Haynes Avenue building in 1927. They met there for almost 40 years until 1968, when as Central Community Church, they moved to a spacious new facility at Scott and Geneva, taking advantage of the growing suburbs in the north end of the city. That congregation, one of the largest in Niagara, recently wrote, uh, relocated again to a, a sprawling state-of-the-art campus in Niagara-on-the-Lake, but it all started in Queenston. The building uh, at Oakdale and Queenston Street was then home to the Greek Orthodox Church, who now uh, occupy the former Maplewood School on Linwood, uh, Linwood Ave and Niagara Street. Um, the French Roman Catholic uh, parish, Eglise Immaculée Conception, started in this unusual building at 223 Church Street. And it kind of looks like it's underground, and it is, because it was intended to be the basement on which the parish would later erect a permanent sanctuary. But in 1967, they decided it was more economical to move to an already existing building on Garnet Street, and this original building now houses the Unitarian Congregation of Niagara. Um, the St. Catherine's Jewish community also found a home in Queenston. Howard Slepkoff has written an excellent comprehensive history of the Jewish community in St. Catherine's entitled A Future in Doubt. Um, and he describes his community as a tight-knit group mostly of Eastern European peddlers who beginning in the early 1900s found a home in St. Catherine's. Part of the glue that held this community together was the sense that they were never really accepted as part of mainstream society. I was shocked to learn, for example, that as late as the 1960s, Jews were barred from joining the St. Catharines Golf and Country Club. When they had the resources to build a permanent synagogue in 1948, they chose the corner of Calvin and Church Streets in, where else, the Queenston neighborhood. So this is Congregation B'nai Israel and the Jewish Community Center. Another institution that has been really integral to the Queenston neighborhood is Connaught Public School. Opened in 1958, or sorry, opened in 1915, 1915, during a wave of school con construction in the second decade of the 20th century, uh, Connaught now, I think, is one of the, it's, if, it's the old, it's one of the oldest, if not the oldest school building in the city. Uh, Connaught has not had the resources that some other schools have had, but it has had a history uh, of attracting creative and committed teachers. The current principal, Jacqueline Ravazzolo, told me that there are a number of teachers at Connaught who were former board consultants, people with specialized expertise in their field, who chose to come back to the classroom at Connaught because of its strong sense of community and its commitment to its students. And I believe that Connaught School will, be, will continue to be a critical factor in the health and well-being of Queenston. So we've looked at the Queenston neighborhood from the perspective of its employment history and its social institutions. A third lens through which we can view this working neighborhood are individuals who have put roots down in Queenston, built a life there, and invested in its well-being. And I'm going to conclude my presentation by giving you a quick snapshot of three people who have helped to build the Queenston neighborhood. In 1855, a 23-year-old man boarded a ship in Ireland bound for America. His name was John McCalla. 
We don't know a whole lot about his early life, except that he was born in 1832 in County Down, which is part of Northern Ireland today. He was one of five children, three boys and two girls. Tragedy struck the McCalla family when John's mother, Susanna, died when he was only five years old, leaving his father to care for five young children. We also know that John McCalla lived through one of the greatest humanitarian disasters of modern times, the Great Famine that de devastated Ireland and parts of Scotland between 1854 and 1852, 1845 and 1852. A mold known to scientists as P. infestans destroyed the potato crop, wiping out the main staple of the Irish diet. The failure of the potato crop was catastrophic throughout Ireland. One report from County Down described emaciated and half famished souls covered in rags lining up for food. Over a million Irish died and another one and a half million left the country, going to England, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, the United States and Canada. Now, we don't know exactly what impact the potato famine or the great hunger as it was known had on the McCalla family, but in all likelihood it influenced John's decision to follow his older brother William in seeking a better life in America. Almost certainly he landed in New York City, then he made his way to Chicago where he lived for two years. And in 1857 he joined William in St. Catharines, Upper Canada. In 1863, he traveled back to Dublin to marry Mary Drysdale and bring her back to Canada. William McCalla had opened a grocery and hardware store located at 9 St. Paul Street beside Shipman's Tavern near the corner of William Street. John went to work for his brother and then they eventually became partners in W.J. and J. McCalla, importers and wholesale dealers in groceries, hardware, paints, oils, etc. And this is a view of St. Paul Street looking east from the corner of Ontario Street from the time when the McCalla's business would have been in operation. It would have been on the left. The store was a growing concern. The McCalla brothers provided the residents of St. Catharines with a wide range of goods from the everyday to the exotic. One of the curiosities in the Brock University Archives collection is a receipt for an order placed by uh, Saint prominent St. Catharines resident Daniel De or Samuel DeVoe Woodruff for a long list of goods, including sugar, tea, starch, soap, indigo, brooms, raisins, currants, cloves, peaches, lobsters, sardines, gelatin, almonds, pepper, candles, scrub brushes, and salt, the order came to an astonishing $83.76, which in today's money would be over $2,100. The McCallas were Irish Presbyterians. John joined Knox Presbyterian Church on Church Street. He was invited to become an elder in 1875, which, if you know anything about Presbyterians, is a really big deal. But he turned that invitation down. We're not sure why. My guess is that he was already making plans to start a new church in the Queenston neighborhood for the people who lived there. In 1876, prominent businessman D.P. Haynes don donated a parcel of land near the corner of Haynes Avenue and Seneca Street and John McCalla paid out of his own pocket to build this small wooden church. John's brother W.J. McCalla built a large impressive mansion on Geneva Street north of Russell called Terrace Gardens, where he and his wife Maria and, his nine chil and their nine children lived. John and Mary McCalla never had children and they chose to live quietly at the corner of Queenston and Ida Streets. He remained a pillar of the Haynes Avenue Church until his death in 1902 a loss that was widely mourned. Although he had no children of his own, he was known as a mentor to many young people. A second individual I'd like to highlight is Joe, is Joe Birchall, who operated this garage at 112 Queenston Street. Joseph Birchall was born in Lancashire, England, where my own grandfather came from. He apprenticed for several trades, including pipe fitting and blacksmithing. Joe came to Canada in 1906. He worked for McKinnon Industries as a machinist, draftsman, and machine designer. During World War I, he was a munitions inspector. After the war, he saw an opportunity in the growing number of automobile owners and opened his garage. If Joe Birchall's name sounds familiar, it's because he was the father of Queenston's very own World War II hero, Air Commodore Len Birchall. In 1942, Birchall's plane was flying over the Indian Ocean 
when they spotted a large Japanese fleet heading for Ceylon, now known as Sri Lanka. They came under fire and were shot down, but they managed to send a radio signal that allowed defenders to prepare for the, ta for the attack and limit the damage. Len spent the rest of the war in a Japanese prisoner of war camp, and he was one brave guy advocating for better treatment of prisoners, even though it led to beatings and solitary confinement. He persuaded his captors to make changes that practically eliminated prisoner deaths. After the war, Len was a member of the Canadian NATO delegation and commandant of the Royal Military College in Kingston. From 1967 to 1982, he was the chief executive of the Faculty of Administrative Studies at York University. And I was a student at York during those years where I got a BA in history, although I never met Len Burchill. Len's family didn't know if he was dead or alive for three years, but he returned home to a hero's welcome in 1945. So Len Burchill was Connaught's uh, public school's most famous pupil. And this is a picture of all the kids in front of the school waiting to welcome him home. In 1938, Len's dad, Joe, brought, bought the property next door to his garage and built this two-story two apartment building, which still stands today at 116 Queenston Street. Now, the Birchill Apartments caused quite a stir. The St. Catherine Standard ran, ran a whole article about it, waxing enthusiastic about the state-of-the-art heating system and amazing amenities like storage lockers and, a, and garbage chute. The apartments were all fitted out with snazzy General Electric ranges and fridges here lined up in front of the building waiting to be installed. And 116 Queenston is still an apartment building today. Joe Birchall's garage, though, is long gone, the site today of a medical office building. A third individual who left her mark on the Queenston neighborhood is Lily Bacchus. Lily was born in 1924 in Baghdad, Iraq. Her grandfather had emigrated to the United States, and it was her father's intention to uh, follow him. When Lily was five years old, they were able to move to France, they thought for a short time, but ended up staying there for over 25 years as the Depression and the war interrupted their plans. Finally, in the 1950s, the family made their way to Canada, first to Saskatchewan, where Lily met and married her husband, Sam. They moved first to Niagara Falls, and then they were able to purchase this house on Queenston Street, which stood between Westminster United Church and the old General Hospital. From this house, Sam operated a barber shop and Lily a beauty salon. In 1967, they sold this property to the hospital, which demolished the house to make room for the new nurses' residence. Sam and Lily used the proceeds to build this building across the road at 185 Queenston Street with uh, three floors of apartments and room in the front for the barber shop and the hair salon. Um, they sold the building in 1988 when the neighborhood was already beginning to decline and it continues as an apartment building now and is home to Yaman Mediterranean restaurant where you can get a fantastic shawarma for $7.50. Although in declining health, Lily, age 98, still lives alone in her house in Port Dalhousie. Well, I think Lily and Sam Bacchus are an illustration of the interconnections that make for a healthy community. Lily told me how her hair salon, I'm just going to go back here, how her hair salon was more than a place to come for a cut and a perm, but a gathering spot for the community. Customers were also friends and neighbors. Lily put out fresh baking every day and people stayed to catch up on news, share stories and build the relationships and networks that are the foundation of human community. Many of Lily's customers and many of their tenants were young women from the nurses' school across the road, again, highlighting the role that the hospital played in the community. Sam and Lily saw themselves as friends, mentors, and surrogate parents to these young women who may have been away from home for, their, for the first time. One of my goals is to do a history of barbershops and hair salons in the Queenston neighborhood because there were a whole lot of them, and I think they tell a fascinating story. Before I close, I want to give a shout out to those who have inspired and assisted me in preparing this look at the history of a working neighborhood. First, Dennis Gannon, whose Yesterday and Today newspaper articles have been just an invaluable source of information about an unbelievable number of people and places. Also, the St. Catharines Public Library's special collection and local history resources. 
And I want to thank the St. Catharines Museum, particularly Sarah Nixon, whose passion for local history and infectious enthusiasm has been a real encouragement. Queenston is a neighborhood today with enormous challenges. Skyrocketing house prices have contributed to a growing number of people who are housing insecure or unhoused. People without homes find a place to live wherever they can, and for many of them it's Queenston, in Richard Pierpoint Park, across the street from Start Me Up Niagara, or around the entrance of the now closed Garden City Arena. Queenston has a higher than average number of sole parent households and poor seniors who scrape by on meager pensions. Queenston has been hit hard by the twin epidemics of opioid drugs, and of course by COVID-19, which was tough for us all, but devastating for people already struggling to survive. I think this picture uh, captures Queenston's challenges, the entrance to the Norris wing of the old hospital, reminding us of a past that seems to be gone forever and of an uncertain future. But Queenston will continue to evolve. Although moving at a glacial pace, the hospital is slated for development, and I hear that progress is being made through all the various city channels to make that happen. My own church, Westminster United, is partnering with the United Church of Canada to build 39 units of rental housing on our back parking lot. So the neighborhood's going to come back. It's only a matter of time. And as people move back to Queenston, bringing a renewed sense of vibrancy, new businesses and community spaces will follow. Telling the story of what neighborhoods like Queenston have been in the past is critical in shaping what they can be once again. We need to be careful that Queenston, that, that we make the right choices, that Queenston doesn't become one more gentrified neighborhood where renewal means that many people can no longer afford to live there. My real hope is that in the renewal of this neighborhood, we will not forget what it has always been, a place where working people can build homes and raise families and live in a neighborhood that works for them. Thanks. Oh, wow, Paul, thank you so much for your very insightful presentation. Your conclusion was incredibly moving and I, I, I really do hope that future comes, uh, comes to be. It's amazing to hear about the rental units being uh, built behind your church. It's such fantastic news. Um, as pastor of Westminster United Church, chair of Start Me Up Niagara, and member of Queenston Neighbors, you truly are a leader in the neighborhood, and it was really wonderful to learn such vibrant bits of Queenston's history from you tonight, Paul, so thank you so much. Thank you. Um, all right, so everyone, if you have any questions or comments for, for Paul, uh, please post them in the chat box now. Um, and if you are looking to connect with Paul more directly, uh, you're welcome to get in touch with the museum and we can are happy to make that connection for you. Um, as, as you hear, he's a, he's a wealth of knowledge in the community. Um, but while we wait for any uh, further questions or comments, um, just a, a quick Conclusion, I'll share my screen one last time for everyone here. Um, let me quickly get down to where we're supposed to be. Eh, I wasn't ready for this section. Yeah. Here, we'll start here. <laughs> I was too busy listening, I guess. <laughs> um, all right, so um, if you are looking to make a donation once I get there. Oh, I think I'm in the wrong one. Maybe that's why. Yeah. You know what, everyone, I got a little too emotional and I shared the wrong, <laughs> the wrong presentation. <laughs> okay. Here we are. Okay. Everyone we're here. Um, okay. So again, if you have any, um, questions, please put it in the chat box. Donations, we would welcome any donations that you're willing to make so that we can continue to uh, give these, these programs. We really do appreciate any donation. Feel free to give us a call at our phone number, which is on the screen here, um, as well as visiting online active STC, uh, the city's um, a program page to make a donation there as well online. And your donations really do make addition, a, a difference here. Also, a reminder uh, that 
We would love for you to follow us on all of our various online platforms, like, follow, subscribe on our social media channels, including right here on YouTube, WordPress, our podcasts, and wherever you get your podcasts, you can, you can find our, uh, our stuff there. We actually have a podcast episode with Paul coming out this Friday on our Museum Chat Live uh, podcast series, uh, where we talk about the Queenston history as well as um, our or oral history project that we've been working with uh, with Paul and other members of the community with. So you can uh, hear that conversation that comes out this Friday the 21st. Uh, also, um, if you would like to share any of our content, that's the best way for us to uh, get out into the community, spread awareness about all of the great stuff we're doing here, and kind of extends our audience even more. So we always welcome sharing of all of these great things. Um, coming up next on our virtual museum lecture series, we're really excited to have a guest and historian Dr. Jonathan Vance to discuss his research into corporate memorials uh, with his lecture entitled Our Gallant Employees Corporate Commemoration in Post War Canada. The virtual museum lecture series is produced by the St. Catharines Museum and Welland Canal Centre and the City of St. Catharines. Okay, I got through the conclusion. <laughs> I'll stop uh, sharing my screen here. And I'm just going to quickly flip to uh, our YouTube channel and see if we have any questions. Um, we have lots of, uh, of great comments. Awesome lecture, says uh, Jude Kadira. Des Corn says, most interesting, excellent lecture. Uh, and then Barbara L Linton asks, if there is a memorial window in Westminster that is dedicated to John McCalla and family, his brother was my great grandfather. Oh, really? Okay, I need to talk to you, Barbara. Um, I, you know what, you, you've got me there. I, I, I don't know that there's a, a single window that's dedicated to the McCallas. You know what, I'm gonna have to go back and look. We have a lot of stained glass windows and um, that's a really good question. Um, I know that there are, you know, there's commemorations of John and Mary uh, throughout the building, but I, I don't know if there's a stained glass memorial window, um, but I, I will go, I will, tomorrow I'm going to look. Oh, fantastic. Okay, so Paul is going to look and maybe Barbara, you can connect with us and we can get you in touch with Paul and maybe uh, great. Maybe yeah, some stuff. Oh, that's great. Um, Probably answer some questions that I haven't been able to answer otherwise. Oh, this is exciting. This is when I love community connections. How fantastic. <laughs> so Barbara, be sure to reach out to us. And um, we have another question from Adam Montgomery. Uh, he says, uh, thanks very much, Paul. I'm curious, what's your favorite story from historical Queenston, if you have one that wasn't in today's presentation? News events or oddities, anything like that? I don't know that I've got, um, I, don't, I don't know if I've got a single story. Um, I, I know the, uh, um, something that, that I wasn't directly involved in uh, was um, uh, the uh, project that was uh, uh, carried out by Professor Elizabeth Lossack at Brock University and um, uh, about the uh, the Garden City Arena, and uh, I have a man in my church, uh, uh, Jerome Cadera, who uh, you know I'm going to get the details wrong, and I think Jerome's listening here. But um, he um, he went to a, a he went to a, a exhibition game with the Montreal Canadiens at the Garden City Arena when he was a kid, and I think he got hit by a puck. And he was uh, he was, you know, upset. And somebody came along and gave him the puck, and it was uh, uh, it was Maurice Richard, and uh, and or it was Maurice Richard, or it was Henri Richard. I'm not sure which, but uh, and he didn't even know who it was. And so it was you know one of the greatest Montreal Canadiens. Uh, uh, so that that's there's a lot of stories about the arena that I think are really charming um because i think a lot of people spent spent time there but um yeah i don't know if i've got another i don't know if i've got another one that i didn't mention tonight 
Um, but one of the things that I really want to do is sort of flesh out what I have prepared with more personal, kind of the oral history approach that the museum's taking, uh, you know, the stories that people have. Um, I had a great conversation with um, Eric Bodner, who was a vice principal at Connaught during the 60s. And he talked about uh, back in the 60s, uh, he, he uh, arranged for other teachers to coach all the competitive teams so that as the phys ed teacher, he was the phys ed teacher, he really focused on um, activities that involved the whole school. So he didn't, you know, spend all of his time coaching the basketball team that, you know, involved just a few kids he he really made an effort to create programs that would involve the whole school and that when i heard that about the 60s it was just so true to the character of cannot school today um that's why i you know began to think about the kind of um uh, qualities that uh endure through time that are, are true of true of that school Oh, that's great. Uh, thank you so much for answering that. I think that's so interesting about uh, about the puck incident at a, at the arena. My gosh, what a what a what a, a puck to get hit with <laughs> from Maurice Richard. <laughs> uh, and we have another comment from uh, Bob Briggs Jew just saying, "Excellent presentation. Thanks, Paul." Um, I do have a question, uh, if you if you don't mind. I, I'm really interested in your research pro like process. Like, from my understanding, I you know you're relatively new to Queenston. Like you came into the community, and this listening to your presentation, it's it's hit on such a wealth of information and so mm -hmm. many different stories from so many different perspectives. Is there like like do you kind of just like hear of a of a building or a place and just kind of dig into it? How do, how do you go about finding all this information? Well, you go to the library and you uh, go through Dennis Gannon's uh, the, the <laughs> yesterday and today. So, you know, Dennis uh, wrote the article about Joe Birchall's garage. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of making connections. You, you get interested in something and it leads to something else. So the first thing I did was go for a walk and I noticed all of these buildings that have been former factories. And that got me, um, you know, that got me interested in, you know, in uh, places that had been, uh, you know, had been employers uh, of people in the community. And, um, and, you know, I, I got in touch with somebody at Goodwill and, you know, you just kind of follow your nose. I mean, you, 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 you get one piece of information and then you, um, then you, you know, I've used I used ancestry to try and track down, you know, find my way through the McCalla family and and there's great uh, there's a great file at the at the library um, about the McCallas and yeah I mean it's just a matter of um, you know finding out one thing and that's a clue that leads you to something else. Oh, that's great. I was I was just wondering, and I love what you said about, you know, using, like, when you say you're connecting with Goodwill, like, you're almost using history as a tool to connect to your community, which I think. Oh, yeah, and so I should say, I should talk about the Queenston Roundtable. Um, Queenston has this fantastic um, neighborhood uh, group uh, called the Queenston Roundtable, and it's for anybody who lives, works, or plays in the, in the community, and we meet every month. Uh, and it's a you know it's kind of a place for people to share what's going on in the community to talk about problems and and solutions to uh, issues in the community and um i i made my, i made a little presentation when i first started out uh with, uh, with this um and i talked about lily bacchus and you know her that building and people just thought like people were just thought that was like amazing so uh i the principal, the former principal at uh, Connaught, Kelly Diorio, um, gave me a whole tote full of pictures and stuff about the school because people just love to find out about things like that. Uh, a friend of mine, you know, grew up on Berryman Street and, you know, he talked about, you know, what it was like when he was a kid and, and um, you know, people in my church, uh, many of them grew up there. Uh, they maybe not live there now, but they grew up there. So, yeah, it's just um, people really love to find out about about what the neighborhood has been, and um, it, it you know it really holds their interest. 
Oh, that's awesome. Oh, well, you're doing such great work. And it was really, really wonderful to, yeah. to hear about your research today. Thank you so much. And if anybody joined tonight who knows things that I don't know, uh, please get in touch because I'm always looking for more leads. Oh, awesome. Great, great call out to our, our uh, listeners, our watchers today. Thank you. Uh, well, it looks like that's it for, for questions okay. today. So I think uh, I think we'll wrap it up then. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Sarah. It's been a real joy to uh, be part of this. Oh, wonderful. Thanks again. And I hope everyone has a great night at home and we'll see you in a, in a couple of weeks for our next lecture. Have a great night, everyone. Good night, everyone.